afternoon. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, before I speak on the uh, substantive issues, I wanted to take further endorse what Mr. Madhavan said about the importance of state legislatures. He gave a number of 30% more than what the union government spends. If actually <clears throat> you deduct the transfers to states, which is a part of the union budget, the state governments collectively spend 50% more than the central government. So the impact actually is huge, and not just by way of um, the quantum of spending, but also by way of the quality of spending, where it is spent. Um, the first two sessions, from what I can see, have been very specific, and uh, this session is a little more generic in terms of strengthening the state legislatures, but uh, what I'll do is, uh, I'll specifically talk about, because there's been a very nicely kind of given a diversity of opinion here, I'll stick to a very specific thing on state budgets and state legislatures, and how does the budget get handled in that, and I'll try and see if we can kind of look at some of the issues that uh, one has been seeing in GNK. But before I do that, I just wanted to kind of mention that, uh, <clears throat> that the GNK state legislature is the most empowered state legislature in the country. It's the only state legislature that has its own constitution. Not only does it have its own constitution, it's the only legislature in the, in the country <clears throat> that has residuary powers. So if you follow a union list, a state list, or a concurrent list, on the concurrent issues where there's a dispute between center and state, the state will prevail. Only JNK has that. No law that the Parliament of India passes can be extended to JNK unless it is ratified by the legislature of JNK. I think this is the most empowered model of federalism in India. And of course, I mean, as you're aware, there's a huge effort to kind of dismantle it. But the fact remains that this is one institution that, uh, that is very empowered. And I must say with a bit of disappointment when I kind of went into, uh, I fought an election and went to the legislature, and I happened to be a part of trying to form the government, and with due respect to Chaudhary Sahib, one of the things which disappointed me was that we had this option of kind of, we were dis it's a coalition between PDP and BJP, and we were kind of distributing portfolios and the spoils of office as it was, and at one point, speakers thing came up, and both parties wanted a minister, not a speaker. And that should tell you how even the elected representatives see the significance of the house. I would have thought that the most important position, the most empowered position in a very powerful legislature like JNK, and that everybody want to become the speaker, but they preferred that let's have a minister, not a speaker. So I think that gives you a certain sense of how, how we have ourselves treated this institution, perhaps the most important institution of democracy in India, how we treated it, it gets treated at different levels, be it the center or the states. Now having said that, uh, let me come to the main kind of things that I wanted to speak about is uh, about the budget. Before I come to state budgets, I just want to give an overview because, you know, what I've seen, um, and I see a number of uh, journalists here, speakers who I have come from that fraternity, uh, stakeholders, including legislators, whether it's at the center or the states, tend to see the budget as an event. Uh, when media sees it, it's fine, I can understand that. That on a particular day, uh, I used to do this, we used to make, you know, it's linked to our revenues, advertising revenues, make a package, do it, and forget about it. But when it comes to state legislatures and this legislators, uh, it's not an event, it's a process. And that is not seen. So what you do is you react to that, that event. The finance minister gets up, makes his speech, and then people react to it. That is point number one. So don't see the budget as an event. I think it needs to be seen as a process. And I'll come to the implications of when you do this, what will happen. Second is the tendency to see the budget as a balance sheet, that it reflects the status of the government. This is a bankrupt government. You know, so the deficit is high, you talk about. So you are in some ways implicitly seeing it as a balance sheet of the government. It's not. Balance sheets reflect the status of an organization whereas budgets reflect the requirements of government. This is the need. So don't, kind of when you look at it, don't see it in a corporate sense. 
it's a requirement thing. It's not a status thing. So automatically associated with that is this whole notion of deficits are bad, surplus are good, ignoring the fact that when center does a deficit, it spends on something else. When states do a deficit, they spend on something else. I think that it just gives you a certain sense of how one needs to understand budgets. And the third point is that this a budget is seen as the end and be all in and of fiscal manage, financial management. It is not. It's just one part of that. I think that's a third point I want to make. As a consequence of this kind of thing, that one sees the budget as an event, life before the budget and life after the budget ceases to exist. Ideally, the engagement should have been before the budget, at least later, typically. We tend to do pre-budget discussions, at least at the state level. Of course, at the national level, it's a much more hype thing, and there is organized lobbying, and uh, you know, we have photo ops with the finance minister. Even at the state level, you tend to meet traders, bankers, industry, manufacturing, and all that. Somehow, we've never met legislators, cutting across party lines. Because at the end of the day, a legislator is involved with his geographical space. He represents an area. He represents people. And um, he has to approve this. So there is no pre-budget uh, pre discussion. And then, of course, there is no post-budget analysis also. It's just that copying the center all very often you actually hear is, you know, this budget is inflationary or whatever. Ironically, the m maximum amount of time in the state legislature is spent on one part of the budget that is not even required to be presented, which is the speech of the finance minister. And you don't actually have to have a speech. You can just get up and present the annual financial statement and say only this much. That is the only constitutional obligation as finance minister one has, that I rise to present the annual financial statement for the current year and table it. We can sit down. This is a, an occasion for glorification of the finance minister. It's a tradition. Yet, the 99% of the debate happens on that particular part. Nobody even looks at <coughs> those 42 volumes which are dumped on the legislature every time there's a budget speech is finished. So I think the whole issue of what one should focus on uh, somehow gets lost. What is important is that somewhere, I think, down the line, it, uh, it's our belief or we think that budgets are made for government accounting. Actually, this is not correct. Budgets are made for legislative oversight and control. Each department has own. You don't have to come to the legislature for that. So I think budgets primarily evolved as a requirement of legislative oversight and not for uh, control. On, and it's structured in that manner, if you see. There are demands for grants. If you go through a budget, it is structured in a manner that it's not so much to facilitate government uh, accounting, but to facilitate legislative approval. So in a sense, I think it's a very important uh, aspect that the budget is designed so that legislators can actually discuss it and approve it. And then subsequently, in their approval, raise issues about it, which I will come to. In fact, India is the only country where the Constitution specifies, in it specifies with the Constitution, what kind of classification has to be given. No other country in the world has this. The Constitution specifies that you must do current and capital receipts and outlays. Somewhere in the 70s and 80s, when extra constitutional bodies like the Planning Commission came into vogue, this part of the constitutional requirement was forgotten, and the entire debate in budgets became plan versus non-plan, which are mythical identities. Mercifully, we have now, this year, the union government is doing it. I started two years back. The first year I presented the budget, I abolished the category of plan, non-plan, and moved to a simple revenue capital budget. It's simple in understanding because I used to speak with my colleagues, 
and you would have planned revenue expenditure. Now, this term itself, why is it revenue if it is expenditure? I mean, you know, it, it, a deliberate effort is made to obfuscate, which I think Mr. Madhavan did refer to. But, you know, uh, I went to great lengths to kind of demystify the budget, as it were, and say that these are not categories that are relevant for you. So you have this plan, revenue expenditure, what does it mean? Half of the, uh, why half? I mean, I think 90% of the students don't even, wouldn't even know that. So what is the implication of if you have a plan, revenue deficit? Now, if you have a revenue, why will you have a deficit? So there are these, and this was in some ways, I think, a whole uh, thing, the way budgetary classifications got obfuscated, and if we had stuck to the original thing, which we have now come back after, I think, 74 was the last year, 1974, when we did the capital budgets and the revenue budgets. Uh, we're coming back to those, uh, those categories now. Again, why I'm saying this is because if even the classification of a budget is done in the Constitution so that the legislators and the parliament can actually look at it from that perspective, then I think the legislators have a much bigger responsibility than just commenting on the speech. So it's not about accounting framework, it's about legislative approvals. No wonder then, if because the budgets are like are, are meant for legislative things, that you see between 1950 and 9, 2007, impact on budget. How budget is presented, what is done with it, nothing at all. So really in terms of the other issue is that in itself, apart from the fact that legislators don't take it seriously, Enough. Um, the importance of budget itself has dwindled, and I'm talking of now particularly union budget. There was a time when budget, union budget, would also be an occasion for big policy changes. And government was the biggest spender by a long, long way. Today, government is not the, it is the single largest spender, but it's not such a large spender. Public Private investments have come in big time, private expenditure is happening. So in that sense, I think the budget significance of budgets as instruments of policy change has also come down. Uh, but when you look at state budgets, they are certainly far less glamorous and far less sexy as it were. This is not even looked at, notwithstanding the fact that two-thirds of the revenue is collected by the states. 70% of expenditure is made by the states, yet state budgets are never discussed. The only organization that has consistently looked at this and put them into some framework is the Reserve Bank of India. They present a volume annually called the state finances, which actually details out these categories and does them in a very consistent manner. Otherwise, if you look at the union budget, state budgets, the categories are variant so much that you can't compare year one with year T minus two. So you have in uh, the state finances, so people, researchers who are interested in looking at it should certainly look at the state finances of uh, which produce RBI. Since 74, a consistent set of data broken up into development expenditure, non-development expenditure, which is something intuitively a layman will understand rather than revenue and capital and so on and so forth. So that is one, one area where uh, one, can, one can focus on. Um, state budgets are, apart from being less glamorous than the union budget, um, they're also uh, very different because they don't impact the macroeconomy as it were. The macroeconomics of a state budget is very different from the macroeconomics of a union budget. Union budget will have an impact on inflation, on interest rates. State budgets don't have that impact. For a variety of reasons, there's no monetization, doesn't happen, it's not linked to the monetary policy and so debt is kind of uh, you know, constrained in a certain manner, you have defined debt limits, and ceilings and so on and so forth. Yet, the state budgets has huge impact on issues like poverty elevation. So when you try and analyze state budgets, it's not about fiscal policy, about interest rates, how will the state budget of JNK or the northern states impact the interest rates of the country? Nowhere. Inflation? Not at all. But what will it change? Yes. It will have an impact on, on ground, poverty elevation happen because it's essentially largely on, uh, on, on, on expenditure, which is the second point I'm coming to, that over time, state budgets have become 
documents of public expenditure. So the underlying policy of public expenditure policy. Uh, and this will happen more so from this year onwards, 17, 18 onwards. Once the GST regime comes in, actually, I, I would seriously look at just kind of presenting an expenditure estimate to the legislature and saying, look, all of this GST is now defined. I have no policy flexibility. I can't change rates. I can't do exemptions. I have become the 12th man in the cricket team. I will supply water once the you know, game is kind of being played. All state finance ministers are nothing but 12th. You know, you are a 12th man in the cricket team now. Zorot padi ko injur injur ho gaya to aap log aajayi batting karne ya fielding karne. So there is no role in that sense. But there is a huge role on expenditure. The focus should be expenditure. In fact, if I would do some loud thinking, <coughs> I would look at it in a sense that center should focus on raising revenues and state should focus on doing expenditures. It is always a better thing to centralize revenue raise and decentralize expenditures. It will be a much simpler, less complicated form of fiscal federalism. Finance Commission has now outlived utility. What will you do now? 42%. Earlier, you had to calculate income tax separately, excise duty separately. All this is over now. Center and states have pooled their sovereignties, come up with this GST, no policy flexibility, good growth, good buoyancy. You will get X number of things. 42% of that gets devolved. Eventually, it may be 50%. I remember I was in the 10th Finance Commission. And for the first time, we had recommended this pooling of uh, the taxes. Till then, it was each tax was, because constitution has its own idiosyncrasies. Some taxes were shall be shared taxes. Some taxes were maybe shared taxes. Income tax was shall shared. Excise was maybe shared. So all these key, key things kept coming up. But then we simplified the matter in 10th Commission and said, let's do the total devolution and do 29%. And I remember that time, I used to work with some very wise and experienced gentlemen, one of them being Mr. K.C. Pant, and the other being B.P.R. Vittal. Uh, and I was one of the younger kind of colleagues, and they said, okay, this will not stop at 29, it will go to 50. <laughs> so I kind of couldn't believe it that now I see 42% already reached. And I, I'm talking of 90, 95, that was the 10th Commission Award. So it's like 20 years later, we are at a situation we are sharing 50. But the point here is that once you do that, what is the role that I have in uh, revenue raising? Nothing at all. I will get a share in taxes. I will, you know, it will be automatic. It will devolve to me. So why, why not look at the federation in a different sense? Today it is far more complicated and very cumbersome. And now that the financial resources are not the only resources, can we look at fiscal federalism including other resources, natural resources? Territorial water control. All coastal states will have this right on territorial waters. Who taxes territorial waters? So what happens to coal mines? Natural resources. India is a natural resource deficit country. Today we have Orissa doing something and saying if you mine in my area, 50% has to be plowed back. Goa bans import mining of ore saying unless you invest 50% here. What is the kind of thing? Can we look at resource federalism? then you will probably elevate the status and strengthen the states. Let's also remember that legislators, legislatures are only as strong as the states are. And if you look at what has happened over the years in a long-term sense, because of the 73rd, 74th Amendment, a lot of powers have gone to panchayats from local bodies, both functions and finances. Now with economic reforms, a lot of revenue raising has gone to center. So between the economic reforms that have centralized the center function and the 73rd, 74th amendments of constitutional amendment of panchayats and local bodies, so you have these panchayats nibbling on my heels and the center on top at the head, I'm getting squeezed as a layer of governance. That can become a very large issue. Because when center starts acting in a rough short manner, the states can then start agitating. You will have, you know, elections and regional parties will come to fore as it has happened. How do you expect panchayats to do that? You have more than, you know, we have 4,000 panchayats in a small state. So you will create a certain vacuum. 
and that can be very detrimental to the entire cause of state legislatures. You need to look at that as an issue. That why we should strengthen state legislatures by all means is the overall, the way the country is looking at federalism. Will it allow for any empowerment of federalism? Because today, from what I can see, both in terms of resources as functions and finances, the panchayats are getting more and more empowered. And that's not a bad thing, but they're getting empowered at the expense of the state government. Because center hasn't devolved. In fact, if, as I said in GST and all that, it's, it's worked the other way. So that squeeze is a, something that I think most uh, states should look at and try and understand these changes, because that has an impact, not just on a particular state, but the entire federalism of the country. Uh, I personally have been a little encouraged by what has happened in the last three or four budgets. I think uh, the current finance minister's two budgets have been, in my opinion, uh, the most federal budgets of India. If you do give uh, like three lakh crores to panchayats, that's a huge exercise in democratization of public expenditure that I have seen anywhere, rather than letting the states do it. So you suddenly have 3,25,000 crores of expenditure going to panchayats. Now, yes, we should strengthen panchayats, but it will certainly improve the efficiency of spending. Even at the same levels of corruption, you will actually reduce the whole thing. So those are healthy trends, I think, where you are looking at democratizing public expenditure. We need to strengthen these institutions, which will then kind of spend uh, these. But coming back to the... Um, to the, to the budget that really you, what legislators, researchers need to see state in state budgets and that will make them very, very relevant is to look at what is the public expenditure policy of these. Um, I think one of the things that uh, Mr. Madhavan referred to is that, you know, how finance ministers want to conceal and possibly, I think, honestly, may not be by design, but I think, yes, at some level that has happened, but I think the, the most regrettable thing, which has really impaired what I call the integrity of the budget is how shoddily we take our responsibility. The entire budget discussion, if it goes beyond the speech, looks at the budget estimates. Has anybody compared the budget estimate to the previous revised estimate? And the revised estimate to the actuals, the actuals are two years old. I can tell you from JNK, in a particular year, the finance minister announces a plan of 9,000 crores gets a legislative approval on it. In the revised estimate, it becomes 6,000. In the actual estimates, it's 2,700 crores. What is the sanctity of that estimate? The tragedy is no legislator looks beyond the budget estimate. The budget estimate is a myth. It's a fiction. If you want to be charitable, it's an aspiration. It's an estimate. Halfway down, RE is something which is better. At least we know what has been spent and actuals is. So in my opinion, the first thing is to do is to look at the actuals, not the budget estimates. And the greater the variation between the revised estimate, the budget estimate, and the actual, the lower is the integrity of the budget. Very simple principle. And the focus should be on that. And explain why. When you came to this legislature, you approved a certain amount of money. Now you're coming back and telling me, I had, out of 9,000, I have spent only 2,700. Why? I think that's where the legislators need to do their pre-budget discussions. And say, before you come to us, it must be done. Second part, liabilities. I mean, given the fact that states technically have a hard budget constraint, you can't do monetization, you can't borrow on tap, you have restricted borrowings, you have limited WMA advances, what do states do? How do they manage? Very simple. They conceal liabilities. So you don't pay. And you have liabilities mounting. A state like JNK, which has a budget of 40,000 crores, the day I took over, I had liability of 26,000 crores. What are you talking of a budget which has a liability? Now you will get in technicality authorized liability, unauthorized liability, treasury liability, departmental liability. All that is nonsense. Simple fact is somebody has done work, he's not been paid. And what has happened then is that when you make an estimate, when a contractor bids for a thing, he factors in two years' time of late payment which actually means that the entire estimation itself is wrong. 
So if you drill down deeper, when you get estimates and say, well, where you had said you will do this road on uh, 8 crores. Why is it 80 crores? Because the, the contractor now knows the game. And that's when corruption starts. You factor in all this. This is a part of the larger budgetary process which nobody sees. That they factor in two years delay, they factor in interest payments and so on. So, so where is the integrity of the estimate? Third, when you are spending, you expect that I am spending 40,000 crores. There is a certain linearity in expenditure. That I will spend X amount in uh, salaries will go every month, interest will go every month and what happens? Check any state government, any year, you will find 60% of spending is done in the last quarter. Why? And then there are, there's a proper uh, racket around it. All these monies go into bank accounts of this government itself to provide for UCs, which leads to another situation. On March 31st, there's a bidding for Treasury whose bill will be cleared and whose bill will not be cleared. And then accounts go into appropriation. You reappropriate the money without reference to legislature. And when you go to the legislature next time, you don't talk about liabilities. This is one category of off-budget borrowings and liabilities. Then there's another one that you go and sign up every single thing, every single guarantee everywhere in the world without providing for it. So you have a whole lot of contingent liabilities. None of this even comes up for discussion that what is the contingent liability of a state government? It will collapse tomorrow. I have given a guarantee of 500 crores somebody. Suppose that guarantee devolves. Who pays for it? Have you sought the permission of the legislator to do this? Or the, has, has any legislator ever asked the state government that can you give me an estimate of your contingent liabilities? What are you facing? What may crystallize from uh, two months from now, three months from now? So conceal one big thing which happens is that uh, because, see, when you look at center, it's more about, as I said, it's an enabler. States are the ones who are executing on the ground. So there, the way you understand the budget uh, has to be very different. Then also, for instance, now look at the current situation I'm in. I'll tell you a simple example. I have done my budget. I've done estimations, money. Suddenly, central government has demonetized currency. Fine. Implications, every penny that is lost in terms of collections, I lose 42 paisa as state government. Nobody consulted us on this issue. Now what will happen? Devolution will fall. I have committed liabilities. What do I, I can't tell center that you haven't mobilized enough. At least some minimum guaranteed devolution that is in the budget system should be provided for. Otherwise, I automatically translate into liabilities. Now a decision of which I am neither a party nor I am responsible, I am bearing the consequences, almost half the consequences. I will now have to fend for myself, my salaries will get delayed, teachers don't get paid for eight months, nine months, wages don't get paid. To conceal the amount of government employment, wages are not paid through wages head, they are paid through O&M maintenance and expenditure. Now these are the kind of little, little frauds that have been perpetuated in the system. And I am on this mission to unravel it because I think it is a legitimate thing that at least one thing must be done is to present a genuine set of accounts. This year, I stopped making payments to PHE casual workers, public health education workers, and rural development workers. I said, I will not pay you. They are all up in arms against me. So I said, I have money, but I will pay through wages, not as part of o &M. Now, why are you not paying them through o &M? Department says that they'll go to court tomorrow, seek regularization. <coughs> They will show that they have been paid by wages. Today, I don't recognize their existence. So there's a whole world that lies outside the budget. To sum up briefly, I, I think the impact of union budget is macroeconomic. It's about inflation, nice interest rates, and others. Uh, but state budgets do impact quality of life in states. If I were to put it, a state budget impacts welfare. The union budget impacts the wallet. Your EMIs go high and all that. But really, if you're looking at citizen welfare, then state budgets are critically more important. State budget is about efficiency of resource use, whereas union budget is about availability of resources. I can print, I can do borrow, I can do whatever, I'll make it available. But the efficiency of use is with the state governments. Um, 
surely one must kind of insist that there has to be a pre-budget made with legislators where we discuss not the numbers. There's no arithmetic, but what is the public expenditure policy? And I said huge amount of discussion should happen between what is the budget estimate, why is it different from the revised estimate, and why is it different from the actual estimate. The story lies in there. And for that, a small technical kind of thing is that please ensure that one demand for grant is discussed at one session. We club demands. Demands refer to, demands for grants refer to expenditures authorization for Typically what happens is to rush through the whole budget, so five mantris get up, make their speeches on the department requirements and sit down. And there's approved, approved. Nobody actually looks at what is the you know, <coughs> wage component of your thing, salary component, development expense, kitna kar rahe, aap maintenance, kitna kar rahe, nothing. And because you merge departments which have nothing in common, you could conceivably look at, I had tried to float the idea that can I do demand for infrastructural sector so that we have some synergy. In R&B rule, all this doesn't work. So that's another kind of technical thing that with the, uh, I'll use the word connivance of the speaker, he's ensured that you do all that. Uh, and I, the, uh, the big reform that one would want to do is two basically, but that every budget. Yes, sir. I mean, is it done by the government? government, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> thing. That's right. Uh, two, two small points before I, before I close that. Please try and restore the integrity of the budget estimate. Nothing should be put in B as capital expenditure unless it's backed by a proper DPR. Today, it's a, it's a number. And the more powerful the minister, the more he gets out of it, period. One reform which I've introduced this year is that every single budget estimate has to be based on a DPR, otherwise I will not take it in the budget estimate. Second is do not allow liabilities to be carried forward next year. If these two things are done, you will see a much better quality of budget and consequently much better development expenditure and consequently a much more empowered legislature who will then look at how the budget should be done. Thank you very much.